Hello, this is the virtual summer camp put on by the University of South Carolina College of Engineering and Computing. I am Ed Gatsky. First of all, I'll start with a little introduction, who I am. I grew up in Huntsville, Alabama, which is the home of the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. It's also Marshall Space Flight Center and Redstone Arsenal. I worked at Redstone Arsenal after high school for a little bit with some engineers there doing support where they supply gases to the rocket engines where they test on the arsenal. Both of my parents were actually rocket scientists. So both of them were math majors, mom and dad, and they both, mom worked on Boeing and dad worked on missile defense for many years. I went to Georgia Tech for my bachelor's of chemical engineering. Then I went to Purdue for graduate work, but I transferred to Delaware, finished my PhD there, and I did a postdoc at MIT. So I've been to a few different universities before I came to USC in 2001. I currently have two kids in Blythewood High School. Um, I guess my daughter is going to be there as a freshman. My son will be a sophomore next year. And they're both active in scouting. I'm actually a scoutmaster for my daughter's troop an assistant scoutmaster for my son's troop. So if you're in middle school and you like the outdoors, I strongly encourage you to look at scouting because it teaches you so much stuff about leadership and skills and all sorts of things are really, really good for you. And it looks good on an application for high school or for, um, for college. So if you apply for scholarships and you're an Eagle Scout, I think that goes a pretty, pretty long way. My research work we don't just teach, um, we also do research. So I work in chemical process automation, which is basically robots for chemical plants, numerical methods, solving hard math problems. Some of the other stuff I work on, student success and retention, keeping our students enrolled at USC, making them successful. I'm a Toastmasters faculty advisor, which means I help people develop their speaking skills. And my wife and I lead a, a trip to Germany on energy during May semester. We didn't get to go this year, um, but we've done it for the last eight years. And I work with a, a bunch of freshmen. We have a lot of freshmen in engineering computing in one residence hall, and I work with that group to try and help them be more successful. So what do I actually teach? My main class is process dynamics and control. That's my, relates to my research area, which basically is, basically is like the thermostat in your house. It regulates your house. It turns on the air conditioner or heater to keep your house at a certain temperature. It seems simple enough, but the math gets a little bit squirrely once you go far enough into anything. Um, I also have been teaching new modeling and numerical methods, which is basically, again, setting up problems and solving them using computers. It's a lot of computer programming and applied mathematics. It's not the relatively simple algebra stuff that you see in middle school and when you're starting out in high school. It's the more advanced stuff using calculus and higher advanced calculus to simulate things and solve things in a computer. For a few years, I was many years I was involved with Project Lead the Way as a I would help the master teachers teach the high school teachers and middle school teachers the classes. So they'd come to campus and we would teach them things like aerospace and mechanical engineering. So I would facilitate that at USC and help teach some of the classes. But I never taught high school and middle school there. But I have been teaching Carolina Master Scholar Duke Tips classes for many years. So these are in the summer or uh, weekend Duke Tips classes on robotics or energy or engineering or aerospace, just a variety of different topics. And they're short, just like this. We've taken some of the highlights from our engineering and aerospace camps and robotics camps, actually, and put them together into uh, basically an online three-day class. So one of my other classes that I work with the freshmen is ethics and professional development. So we have a class that helps them be academically successful when they get to USC. And that's one of the things I've organized over the years. What I'm maybe most famous on the internet for, I shot a video years ago at our engineering week. We get a thousand pounds of cornstarch and we show this video, or we shot this video. It turns into a, a fluid that acts like a solid when you step on it. But if you stop moving, it turns it's into a liquid. It's all over, it's all over. He's going down. Oh. So I've got 50 million views on this series video. And then cornstarch is amazing. It's like a solid, but also like a liquid, depending on how you treat it. And that's a, a class you take in engineering called fluid dynamics or fluids. And you learn more about viscosity and how thick fluids are and how they flow. So another thing about me I think is a little bit interesting. You might find it interesting. Um, I was in the Governor's School 
the Alabama Governor School, which was just a summer program when I was in high school. If you can do a governor school, it might be a good option for you. The ones we have in South Carolina are actually stay away schools for junior and senior year. So you go away to a different high school. But my summer school, I remember they had a special guest speaker come and talk and he was a big guy in the human genome project which is a big deal and i know that now but when i was a high school student he said you're not going to remember anything about the human genome project if i talk to you that about today i'll talk about all the travels i've done because as a scientist or an engineer you can travel around the world a lot and see a lot of different things um, my wife and i with our kids when they were smaller about 10 years ago we lived in germany for a whole year working with the university of stuttgart and during that time, every weekend, we'd take trips all over Europe. We'd drive all the way to Paris in one weekend or go up to Denmark or down all over, basically all of Europe that you can get to. We even flew to Greece, which is not real close to the rest of Europe. But all these other places, it's just like going a couple of states over, up to North Carolina or down to Florida. It's not an unbearable weekend trip in many cases. We also did the little ones that you've probably rarely heard of. Luxembourg, which is actually pretty big. Liechtenstein, which is not real big. It has a McDonald's. Monaco is the Grand Prix. If you ever saw Iron Man 2, we sat right where they filmed Iron Man 2. The same year they filmed Iron Man 2, the guy with the whips. Uh, that was right where we were sitting for some of the Monaco Grand Prix. Andorra, which is between Spain and France. And Vatican City, which is a separate country, and they have their own money, like euros. They're part of the euro, so you can get euro coins with Vatican City imprints there. Some of our other travel, I've been in Australia. That's a long plane ride. Same thing going to all the places in Asia, Hong Kong, China, Japan, Thailand, Canada for different stuff. As a family, we've been all over the U.S. We've been up and down New York, the East Coast, Boston, D.C. We've been out to Hawaii and Las Vegas. Um, I've spent some time on the Appalachian Trail. My son and I went to Philmont Scout Ranch, and I get a chance to go to Sea Base down in Key West this summer with both of my kids. I'm going with my daughter uh, one trip, and a couple weeks later, I get to go with my son. So, what are we actually doing today? Our plan is to do online lectures. We'll do um, basically talk about stuff that we would talk about in a regular camp, but then I give you some introduction to hands on projects and software which is the stuff we'd be doing during the day. So you can go and try it out on your own, um, try out the projects, try and do the projects if you have the materials, try out the software. I think all the software is pretty general. It may not work on a Chromebook, but it should work on a laptop and may work on a Chromebook. I haven't tested on a Chromebook very much. And then we will have live discussion sessions. So uh, basically rehashing the lectures and trying to answer questions about some of the projects if you have questions about that. So we'll start out Next week, I guess on Monday, first class, we'll have a morning and afternoon session, live sessions. And this is the first one, so it's energy and forces. The next one is trusses and structures and material strength. We have one on computing, and then we have something talking about robotics. We'll do some on circuits and circuit systems, Arduinos and microbits, talk about that. And the after third day, we'll usually, when we have a Carolina Master Scholar, we spend some time talking about careers and what do the engineers actually do and what are the differences between them. And there's a lot of activities and software here that I'll try and introduce you to or point you to. Some of these you could spend a lot of time, like the Arduino and Microbit, that teaches you a whole lot about hardware and how you get computers basically to program the hardware to do things like robotics. And um, Scratch is a programming thing. A lot of people have used it before, but computing is such a powerful tool. I want to make sure everybody gets exposed to that um, because it's, it's so useful for a lot of things we do. The other stuff are you know, more hands-on. Like uh, We can't do some of the hands-on bridge building because you don't have the, the equipment we typically would use, but I found software that simulates some of these things. So we won't build balsa wood trusses, but we have software that simulates that or the, the uh, bridge that we usually do. We have a couple of activities there. Some of these are simulations. Some of these you can do if you have minimal activities like the fermentation and mold activity, rubber band catapult. Some of these things, are, you, a trip to the grocery store, you can probably find the, the, the stuff that makes it up. For the circuits, you can we'll put a link out for the Arduino and Microbit. You can order those and play around with them. They're not too expensive. They're maybe 15, 20, 30 dollars but I have the software. You can play around with the software and do the simulation. It's not the same experience as getting your hands and touching the hardware. So if you can order it and you have 20 bucks in your budget, it's great to have those. You can learn so much from these circuit systems. Uh, the, both of them are interesting in different ways. We'll talk about that later. Um, and all the software, some of these are games. 
just because I think it teaches, it demonstrates puzzle solving, logical flow, it sort of relates to physics in some cases. Some are just simulations, some are challenges where you're trying to do these. So these are all the different activities. Um, you probably could do all of this in a three day period, watch the video and do the activities, but some of them are a little more time intensive and you can always, you could spend an entire summer developing scratch games. You could spend an entire year developing Arduino circuits and robotics. So these are just gateways trying to give you a little introduction to the topics so you can dig into them later, whatever you find an interest to, to go into more. So I usually start off my classes for Carolina Master Scholars talking about what is science. My wife is a PhD chemist, so she's a scientist. I'm an engineer and they're a little different, but the definition of science is a systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. So they learn stuff about stuff. So science is an intellectual pursuit trying to learn things. Um, when I met my wife, she told me she was working on chemistry of rhenium. And I, as an engineer, I wasn't even real sure what rhenium was. It's, it's an element in the middle of that periodic table you don't really remember. But that's all she worked on her for her old PhD, making molecules with rhenium and characterizing and understanding how they worked. And she didn't really have a, she wasn't, they were, their project wasn't directly like trying to solve, cure cancer or make a better plastic for automobiles. Is basically discover a new molecule and talk about it and learn about it. Engineering is a little different. So engineers, it's a branch of science and technology more on the, a lot of times more on the technology, concerned with design and building and use of engines, machines, and structures. So engineers make stuff and do stuff. So usually there's a purpose, there's an engine or a machine or a structure so that we need to design and build or figure out how to use better through technology and science. So we use science, we use math, and we use computers. So those three go together to do engineering. So the next thing I wanted to get into was talking about energy, because this is one of the first things we would normally do. We have some really cool Lego kits that are special for energy. So we can make a windmill and then test it out with a fan. We can store up energy. We can use photovoltaic Lego kits to run motors and store energy, turn on lights. So that kind of stuff, not everybody has those. In fact, I've collected Legos for many, many years. And I've, you have to special order these educational Lego sets and not many people even know they exist. But we're not gonna to get to do that today because we're all doing this virtual camp. But we'll go through some of the basics, the concepts that are pretty important to understand. So energy. So energy is something you need to tuck away in your brain and understand. The definition is the ability to do work. So energy and work are related. But then you ask, what is work? And if you look up what work is, it's the transfer of energy. So this is, a, a, sometimes definitions don't help you a whole lot. So you're trying to do work, but what is work? The transfer of energy. So that doesn't help us. So seems silly, but we'll get into it in a second. Energy and doing work are the two related concepts there. So there are types of energy, and you should be pretty familiar with these. You've got kinetic energy, which is energy of motion. And you've got potential energy, stored energy. Those are two different ones you've probably talked about in middle school science. So potential energy can be turned into kinetic energy and the releasing of energy or changing energy from one form or another can result in big, big disasters in some cases. So we talk about kinetic energy, something moving. There's a formula, one half mv squared, the mass times the velocity squared. So you can use this to calculate how much energy is in something like a bullet or a ball or a rocket ship. If you know the mass and you know the velocity, you can figure out the kinetic energy. So like a satellite, you have to have a lot of velocity to get a satellite into orbit fast enough at a high enough at the altitude so that it will basically fall. And as it falls, it keeps going around the earth in its orbit. So it keeps falling, but it keeps going to the side with a high enough velocity that it just basically falls around the earth. Um, like you could, act, if you could shoot a bullet fast enough, and there were, if you didn't have any air resistance, you could actually shoot a bullet, like ten feet off the surface of the Earth, and it would go around in the orbit. But we have air that slows it down, so that that's why we have satellites in outer space. You put enough energy, enough velocity into it, you get it going fast enough that it orbits. Now, temperature is a funny one. 
you think of temperature, you measure temperature and it has energy in it, but the amount of energy correlates to motion of the atoms inside of substance. So if you have a solid, it sort of vibrates and that slow vibration, uh, the molecules don't break apart. If you have a liquid, they start to slide apart. They're not totally bouncing around. You get into a gas or even a plasma, which is a different state of matter, you have molecules that are hardly touching each other. So the liquid and gas, if you, you basically temperature is a, a measure of the kinetic energy inside the material. Potential energy is another one. The formula you'll see in physics, if you remember this one one day for your physics class, maybe your phys physical science freshman year or physics if you take that in high school, uh, density times the force of gravity times the height. So you can talk about a roller coaster, how much potential energy you have at the top of the hill, a ball on a hill. We talked about this for a dam. Um, uh, so the water going across a dam, you can figure out the energy that you can extract from that water as it falling from the height of the dam because you know the density of water, you know the force of gravity, and you know the height of the dam. Electric potential is another one that's interesting to think about. Um, the electrons want to move. So if you have electrons that are all excited, they have a voltage and they want to shock you or do go and do some work, so that's an electric potential. So you get those electrons all charged up and ready to go, and that's another type of potential energy. And chemical potential molecules that want to react. Some molecules don't want to react too much, like water. But if you take hydrogen gas and oxygen gas and you give them a spark in the right conditions, they want to react and go to a lower chemical potential. So it's like having a ball up a hill. You get a little nudge and you get a ball rolling down the hill and you can get those chemical reactants, hydrogen and oxygen, they're separate molecules. You put them together and you get them going and they start generating heat and reacting and making water. So it can be pretty exciting with chemical potential, but these are different types of potential. Um, elastic potential is one we sometimes think about, and we're going to use that one in one of our projects. The energy stored in a spring. So a rubber band is a type of spring. You're not breaking bonds in the rubber band. You're just sort of stretching the bonds. So you pull it apart and it stores some energy. You put energy into it to pull it apart, and then it, when it releases, it turns into kinetic energy. So how do we measure things? This is something else we do in science and engineering. We have to be able to measure things, quantify things. The biggest one to understand is mass, like a kilogram. And if you think about stuff in terms of pounds, one kilogram is about two pounds. And I, one gram is about a paper clip. So a, a kilo is a thousand, so a thousand paper clips is about a kilogram, if you can think about it that way. So I usually try and think about relationships to stuff, I sort of have a clue what order of magnitude, how big it is. Is it the size of a paperclip? Is it the size of a bowling ball? Is it the size of a car? Length, we measure stuff in meters using the SI units, which is about three feet, if you like feet, like a yardstick. So a hundred yard football field will be a hundred meters or a tenth of a kilometer. Force, this is where it gets a little tricky. Force is mass times acceleration. We measure that in Newtons, like Newton's apple. So Newtons are kilogram meter per second squared. So mass is in kilograms. Acceleration is a weird unit. It's how fast you accelerate. So meters per second squared, you'll learn more about this in physics. If you drop a ball on Earth and you don't worry about some of the other stuff like air resistance again, it will accelerate at a fixed speed. 9.8 meters per second per second. So after one second, it'll be going 9.8 meters per second. It starts at zero. After one second of falling without air resistance, it should be going 9.8 meters per second. After two seconds, it's going to accelerate another 9.8. It's going to be twice that, which is like 19.6 meters per second. So it would keep speeding up faster and faster, but in reality, eventually it um, will not keep accelerating because the, the air resistance would slow it down and the two forces would balance. But F equals MA is a big, that will, these three things, these concepts will get you through most of the physics class in high school and a lot of your college physics, if you understand units and the difference between energy, work, force, length, these kinds of things. So energy is not the same as a force. Force is moving one Newton, one meter, and we measure that in joules. So Newton was a guy with the apple, joules a different guy. So a Newton meter, you take an apple, basically an apple, a small apple, has about the same weight, which is force. One Newton, a small apple is about one Newton. 
So if you have a small apple and you move it one meter, about three feet, and you do that, that has one joule of energy. It takes one joule of energy to move it, and when it's sitting there three meters or one meter off the ground, three feet off the ground, it has that much potential energy, one joule. There's stored energy in that, and it's waiting to be released. Power is the other one. If you can do one joule of work in one second, it's a watt. Uh, so that's one watt is a joule per second. If you take that apple and you lift it one meter and you do it in one second, then you go and grab another apple that's one newton in weight. So a small apple, you lift it one meter and you keep doing that every second, three, three feet, 3.2 feet, do that every second, that's one watt. And sometimes we talk about light bulbs. You're probably not as familiar with the old light bulbs that are hot, but a big light bulb used to be 100 watts and it generates a good bit of heat. These days we use compact, compact fluorescents or LEDs. So that is a different kind of power, but you know, a 60 watt light bulb versus a 100 light watt light bulb generate different amounts of heat. They use different amounts of power or energy per time. So energy and power are very much related. And if you have a small car, it might have 100 horsepower, not a big Bugatti. This is like a small car is 100 horsepower, and that's about 75 kilowatts. So there's a relationship between power of your car and your kilowatt, which is 1,000 watts. So 75 kilowatts is pretty big. I think a buddy of mine has a Tesla, and I want to say his Tesla has like 700, 700 horsepower. So lots of kilowatts, lots of power, and it accelerates really fast because, really fast because it can do a lot of work very rapidly. So a small car with only 100 horsepower would have 75 kilowatts to give you some idea of some of these mass of these numbers and relationships. One thing engineers worry with is efficiency. Since we're often converting energy from one form to another, we have to worry about doing it efficiently. Nothing is 100% efficient and energy is conserved. So the energy goes somewhere. And normally if we were in person, we have this cool demo we'd set up where you have a light, a very bright light used for photography. You plug that in, it's probably a couple hundred watts, very hot, it gets, it'll melt things, it's so hot. Maybe two or 300 watt light bulb, very bright light bulb. We put it, shine it onto a photovoltaic cell. This is converts photons, energy from the sun or from a light into electricity. So you take photons and you convert that into electric potential. These two wires convert into electric potential. It goes to electrolysis, where you have water in this little cell. You put electricity into that cell and it will split water, H2O, hydrogen and oxygen, into different gases. So you put energy in and you split that molecule of water into hydrogen and oxygen. And you get two different gases on the different sides of the electrode. You have a positive and negative electrode, you get oxygen and hydrogen. One goes one way, one goes the other way, and they bubble up. It's sort of cool to see it bubbles up into this tube. You can watch the bubbles as they form up here in this tank. So now you have put electric potential into chemical potential because now hydrogen and oxygen want to get together. And then we give them a chance to get together in another reactor, which is the reverse of electrolysis. It's called a fuel cell. It converts oxygen and hydrogen back into electricity. So you go from electricity to chemical. You can store that hydrogen if you have a big enough tank and then you put it back into your fuel cell and it generates electricity. So it converts chemical potential into electric potential and the electric potential runs a little motor and we get a fan. <clears throat> this little motor runs and spins a little fan. So we go from like two or 300 watts over here down to maybe a 10th of a watt over here. Each time you convert from one type of energy to a different type, you'll lose some efficiency and it goes off into typically heat energy, which is not retained. So we go from a lot of energy down to a tiny little bit because at each stage we lose probably at least half in many cases. So all that energy is just typically dissipated in heat. All that energy here, not all of it is converted. Fuel, um, photovoltaic cells are typically 10 to 15% efficient. Electrolysis might be 80 or 90% in some cases. Fuel cells can be 60, 70, depending on how you set up all these things. Even a motor is not 100% efficient, but after you take losses at each stage, <clears throat> some of that's converted into heat. So how do we convert heat energy into motion? This is what we figured out years ago for the steam engine. If you boil water and you make steam, 
steam turns into about 800 times more volume than water. So you go from water, which is a liquid, and you heat it up enough to boil it, it goes to molecules like we talked about before. You put enough energy to make that phase change, <coughs> it will change volume, and you use that volume change to push a turbine. <coughs> so you put your steam into this turbine, and it will push a piston. You can do a piston or a turbine. Um, I'm going to post a video with my steam engine and my other engine. But as it expands, it pushes that piston, and we have a flywheel, and has a little bit of energy so to get the piston back in the right position, that flywheel uses some of its energy to push the piston back in so that the valve can open again and let more steam in. So as you cycle back and forth. A turbine is a little different. It just spins continuously. And it's, it can be more efficient, but they're more expensive and harder to run. It can be open or closed. A lot of times you take that water that after the steam, after it's been run through, you um, condense it, pressurize it, put it through a boiler, and make more steam. So that water keeps cycling over and over and over. And that's how coal-fired electric electricity plants work to generate motion. It's how nuclear-fired electricity plants work <coughs> convert heat to make something into a vapor that pushes a piston or a turbine and convert that into mechanical motion. A Stirling engine is pretty cool. That's a, a neat one. Well, I'll show you a demo in a different video. It's the same kind of thing if you have a heat difference. You have hot on one side and cold on one side. Hot air wants to expand. The air does work by expanding the piston. But there's a flywheel again, and it pushes that air back onto a cold side so the air condenses. So just like in a steam engine, you have the water that's expanding and condensing. Now you have air or some other working fluid in your Stirling engine to do work. And as long as you have a heat difference, you can make engines that will turn into motion. So if you're hot on one side and cold on one side, you can have a fire and you can have water or something cold. And that will work enough. Even air is usually enough to make a Stirling engine run. And these can be actually more efficient than other types of engines, depending on how you do it. So why do we care about energy so much? Really, it relates to our basic human needs, food, water, and shelter. They talk sometimes about energy, food, water, nexus, putting these all three issues together. There's lots of relationships between energy. If you have energy, you can get food. If you have energy, you can get water. Because a lot of people don't have a lot of water, clean water. So if you have lots of energy, you can make lots of food and water. Uh, but for water, you need energy and you need food. Or you, water's good for food. <clears throat> they relate back and forth. You have to have the clean water for people to live. You have to have energy for people to live. You have to have food for people to live. So those three things, if you have those in the excess, water, food, and energy, you're just, I would argue, energy and water is enough to make sure you can do food. Um, so it's a big problem, and we always don't have to worry about it for population growth and limited resources. It really relates to technology. Hundreds of years ago, we were, lived in a wood burning animal energy kind of environment. If you've ever get, seen those old, old timey windmills, they have a giant big windmill, like in uh, Denmark, those windmills would only generate maybe five horsepower. And these days you can get a five horsepower gasoline engine on your lawnmower to run around that's super tiny compared to a giant building. Industrialization occurred when we could burn coal or other act things to make steam energy. So that, that's when we started making factories. We had bigger, a lot more powerful steam engines that can do more work for pumping things, um, moving things bigger, bigger machines. We learned about higher energy density like gasoline. So we can, if we have more, we don't have steam cars because it's really heavy to make a steam engine. But a gasoline engine has a lot of potential in the gasoline, a lot of chemical potential. So you can drive it around, put it in your lawnmower, in your, your car, your, your airplane. Nuclear is another one we've worked with because there's a lot of energy in nuclear and you can convert that into heat energy for making power. And we've been working for years now on solar and wind development, and that seems to be the way we're going in the future because it's renewable and basically gets energy from the sun. I have a class that my wife and I have taught. I mentioned it earlier. We go to Germany every May for two weeks, and we study. It's a college class. It's a survey class. We talk about traditional energy sources, coal, burning coal or natural gas. How do we get natural gas from fracking? <clears throat> nuclear, which is sort of like tradition, it's like burning, but you take uranium or plutonium and convert it into other 
types of atoms but release a lot of energy. That E equals mc squared formula, you convert a little bit of mass into a lot of energy. So that's a very important formula. We talk about hydroelectric and how you convert power or water power into electric power. But we spend most of our time talking about solar and wind, geothermal, nuclear, and biomass. And Germany is a great place to go because they've been working in these areas and investing a lot of money into these things. And there's a lot of history. We get to go to the tallest church in the world, which is near Munich. Uh, we go to some old castle ruins. I love seeing the old castles. But we go to windmills. We go inside a windmill up close. We go to a geothermal place near Munich where they have used uh, hot water to make the biggest water park in Europe. It's not that great. It's, it's like something at, at the beach. It's, it's okay. It's nice, but it's, it's big for Europe, I guess. They have a, in Munich, they have a nuclear reactor. It's not a traditional fission reactor. It's a fusion reactor where it's like the sun. Instead of breaking uranium, plutonium, you're taking hydrogen and isotopes, putting them together to make helium. <clears throat> we go to a farm where they're making biomass. They convert biomass and burn that to make electricity and steam for the local area. So there's lots of cool stuff we see on this trip. And Germany, is a, they have a, a lot of a jump on us as far as energy development and their infrastructure. All right. So that's basically the lecture topic. Now we're going to talk about a couple of projects. The first one I wanted you to look at was a rubber band catapult. You don't need a lot of materials for this. Rubber bands, craft sticks, a little paper for a projectile, and water for a little piece of paper. Um, maybe a plastic spoon or metal spoon might work too. You could do this with Legos if you have Legos. You could try it. So your goal is to launch a projectile, either a coin, small ball, whatever you want to launch. And you're converting elastic potential when you stretch the rubber band into kinetic energy as you shoot the rocket. Not the rocket, as you shoot the, the ball down downfield away from your catapult and there are lots of catapult designs online if you want to look at these there's some that are legos you use rubber bands and you make those so the simplest one you might want to start with is just a like like a pencil and two and that's a tongue depressor uh, with a couple of rubber bands these are a little more intricate and i tried building one of these myself i'll show you the one i did it's pretty wonky it sort of works. It actually works pretty good. It shoots pretty far, um, but it doesn't look real pretty. And but it'll shoot a little ball of paper. I mean, a tiny little ball of paper. It'll shoot three to six feet, so you're not going to hurt the cat. Um, but you can do this, and it's a little challenging to get these corners right. I started off making a square, and then I made two upright supports, and then I added on the crossbars for mine, and then I attached my spoon on there. So I made the square, get in the corners, and I made these two triangles almost to give it a little bit of structure. And then it, I didn't spend a whole lot of time making it real straight, but it shoots pretty good. And basically you just put a rubber band on there and twist it up. I did double up my popsicle sticks to give it a little more strength because I had cheapy, like dollar store popsicle sticks that weren't that great. Um, just, you know, 70 cents worth of rubber bands from Walmart. And I went to town, made this catapult, but it launches pretty well. Definitely don't break stuff. You want to try and make it strong. So if you have to use extra rubber bands, it doesn't hurt to wrap them around, give it a little more strength. And you can always slide the rubber bands, um, the popsicle sticks and rubber bands to make your catapult look a little better than mine. <coughs> but your goal really should be to hit a specified target consistently. So you can adjust the launch angle, which puts different amounts of potential energy into your catapult. So can you hit the same spot 75% of the time, three out of four times? So try four times from the same spot. Can you get pretty close to the same distance every time? And what I really would want you to do, if you, if, you, if you have a pretty consistent catapult, is to calibrate for three different targets or different, basically do more of a, a scientific type experiment. So to make a table, if you have Excel, that's one thing. You can use Google Sheets for this either. Pull back to the same angle and launch the same projectile three or four times and measure that distance. So if you know anything about degrees, 30, 60, 90, so catapult the arm straight up would be zero degrees. If you pull it back a third of the way or two thirds of the way or all the way back to a right angle, those are three different degrees and you can launch the same projectile and then measure how far it goes. Record that and then get the average for 30 degrees and the average for 90 degrees and the average for 60 degrees. So you get those three different averages. As you pull it back more, it should go further. 
Now, the interesting thing is, if you know that between 30 and 60, we go on average 12 or 21, if you want to hit 18 inches, maybe you can adjust this. You can use this table as information. Well, it's somewhere between 12 and 21. Well, the diff difference between 12 and 21 is 9 inches, all right? So 18 inches is 6 inches more than 12. So basically, it's two-thirds of the way between 30 degrees and 60 degrees. So you have to go between 30 and 60, if you could figure it out exactly, it would be actually 50 degrees that you'd want to use to get 18 inches. And you can do the same thing for 25 inches. It's somewhere between 21 and 29. This one's 8 inches of difference. So 25 inches would be 4 inches. So it's exactly halfway in between 21 and 29. So halfway between 60 and 90 is 75. So if you can figure out exactly what your angle is, you can recalibrate and hit a new target. And this is an area of mechanical engineering. Mechanical engineering, it's related to mechanical engineering, I should say. It's not an area. You don't make catapults typically in mechanical engineering, but it's related to the design and production of machines that involve force and movement. So anything with movement and force. It's like an automobile engine. Um, so you use physics, thermodynamics, materials, electricity, structures. So a lot of different parts of science and engineering go into mechanical engineering. It's a very broad area. You can work on turbines. This is a big turbine. I think that could be a steam engine. I'm not sure what that turbine is. Or you could work on designing parts that go into an engine. So the engine has a lot of different parts um, and you have to make sure they are strong enough and they last and they're manufactured appropriately. But it all involves force and movement and these different relationships. You have to understand how materials work and electricity works and uh, thermodynamics and heat work and physics. Put all that together and you can solve problems with mechanical engineering. The next project I want to talk about today is fermentation. Um, you get a bottle, plastic bottle is fine, a little bit of sugar, some yeast, warm water, and a balloon. And we're basically going to convert sugar, which is one type of chemical energy, into ethanol, which is a different type of chemical energy. So chemical reactions rearrange molecular bonds. And this is a chemical reaction where the yeast is converting sugar into ethanol. What you do is put about an inch of warm water into a bottle, add a spoonful of sugar and a packet of yeast. I used Fleischmann's yeast, one packet. I just swirled it around and I put the balloon over the top and I sealed it up. And I set it aside and it may take hours or overnight. I just put mine together about an hour or two ago and it's already growing. It, the balloon was sad like in the picture and now my bottle was all um, compressed down and mushed together at the top and now the bottle has expanded. There's enough pressure in there that the bottle expanded out to its full volume and the balloon is already starting to blow up about two hours later. So it's a pretty quick reaction. You can see the yeast, what they're doing is eating the sugar and generating alcohol and CO2. So yeast will convert sugars. They eat the sugar and they convert that to carbon dioxide and alcohol if you do it anaerobically, which is a fancy word for not no oxygen. There's not a lot of oxygen in there. There's some in the bottle and there's some in the water because it puts stress on the yeast. When the yeast, they freak out and they start eating the sugar and making alcohol. And people have been using this for thousands of years, going back to the ancient Egyptians. Um, you can make beer and wine out of this. This, I would, this is not something you would want to drink. It's probably absolutely terrible. Yeast, yeast usually for making bread, which is basically sort of like fermentation when you have the bread as it rises. But why are we talking about it? Alcohol is actually a fuel. If you can purify this, you might be able to ferment your alcohol, your sugar and, and yeast content up to about 10 to 15 percent alcohol and the rest is water. You can't burn that in an engine. If you can separate the alcohol and the water, you can actually burn it in an engine. And we'll talk about that in a second. So like I said, chemistry is rearranging bonds between molecules. You're taking atoms and you're changing how they're arranged in molecules. Molecules are collections of atoms. Chemical engineering is basically making money by doing chemistry. So you take something of low value and you make it into a higher value product. And the two things that chemical engineers use are reaction and purification, converting with chemistry and then using chemistry to make something pure. <clears throat> so the actual reactions, I like these stick models. This is what you often play with in high school chemistry and college chemistry. 
We start off with glucose. There's a lot of different sugars, but this is a simple one. Glucose has six um, carbons. That's not glucose. Because it has, well, it is, I'm sorry. There's six carbons, the black ones, one, two, three, four, five, six. And it has six oxygens, one, two, three, four, five, six, the red ones, and 12 of the hydrogens. So that molecule of glucose is a stick figure. There's a bunch of different, you can look up fructose, sucrose, there's different sugars out there. The yeast will take this up, use it in the biological process, and generate ethanol, which has two carbons one oxygen and a bunch of hydrogens and some carbon dioxide which is a carbon with two oxygens on it and these double bonds are special we learn about those in chemistry as well single bonds and double bonds and even triple bonds but the biggest thing you learn about in chemical reaction you have to balance your equations so if you have six carbons on here you have to have there's two carbons and then two there's two carbons in each ethanol molecule so you have two ethanol molecules and two carbon dioxide molecules produced so that you get four plus two six carbons over here and for oxygen, you have six here. Each ethanol has an oxygen, and each carbon dioxide has two oxygens, so that makes six over here. The hydrogens balance the same way. So that's one of the things you spend a lot of time doing in chemistry, balancing equations and making sure you understand how to name the different materials and how they balance when they react. I mentioned purification. One of the things you might do in a chemistry lab, you take a mixture, maybe 10% ethanol and 90% water, and you boil it. And when you boil it, the vapor has more ethanol in it and when you put it through a condenser tube this is full of cold water it condenses that vapor and you generate something over here that's more pure than it started out with if this were 10 percent it might be 40 percent in this one stage and you take a whole class in chemical engineering on looking at percentages you can do this repeatedly and this is a what they call a distillation tower um, so this is a one stage simple boiling process in a distillation tower you have these trays so the vapor goes up and the liquid goes down and each stage is like one of these little batches over here where you have a separation so you get some purification at each stage and by having a big tower like you might see along the interstate like the, there's a uh, one near columbia that you might see on the interstate going to charleston you can get a separation and you can go very pure um, so you can get almost pure water and almost pure alcohol. There's a problem with alcohol. You can't get completely pure because of the way the chemistry works out. But you learn about that in engineering too. And if you ever go out on Lake Murray, one of my places you might stop by is a Hollow Creek. They have a old school distillery, which is sort of like industrial applications. They've actually been making um, alcohol for hand sanitizer during the quarantine. So you take your fermented mash which is basically corn plus yeast, and you ferment it for a while. You put it in this boiler. It boils up to the top. It goes through a second stage, which is called a thumper. So you only have two stages. So you go from 10% to about 40%, and then maybe 40 to maybe 60%. And this is a big condenser that makes the product. So that's a this is like a grown-up moonshine still out in the woods, um, but it purifies pretty well up to 60 or 70% if you do it right. And if you do it industrially, you can purify up to 95%. Um, it's not just for alcohol. You can also separate things like gasoline, different types of gasoline, jet fuels are different. Asphalt is actually, if you heat it up enough, it becomes liquid and flows. Uh, there's the one I mentioned, the air products process down on the interstate, I-26, they separate oxygen and nitrogen. So if you liquefy oxygen and nitrogen, you can get a split there. So you can get a separation and purification of those two gases. So pretty much everything, because things boil at different temperatures, it boils down to you can separate them and make them more pure. So chemical engineering is supporting chemical production and manufacturing using chemical processes, basically reactions and separations. So my wife, like I said, said she's a chemist. The first time she went to a chemical plant, she said there's pipes everywhere because you have reactors and these distillation towers and separation. Uh, you pump stuff around and you move it and there's pipes going from one thing to the other thing and it's very overwhelming. I used to work in a paper mill and we'd take low value wood and we'd chop it up and we'd cook it in a reactor and we'd separate the different parts of the wood and then we'd put it through a machine and generate paper. Um, so that makes a higher value product from relatively low value wood chips and we convert it into different types of wood through chemistry and some mechanical processes because putting it on the 
forming it into a sheet is more of a mechanical process, but separating and purifying the fibers and the paper is more of a chemical process. You can work in pharmaceuticals or food. There's lots of different things that chemical engineers work in. One of our other topics we want to get started is mold. Basically, you may have seen this one on the internet. You get slices of bread and Ziploc bags looking into bioorganism growth because biomedical engineers work on devices and they talk about biological systems and they take a lot of... Chemical engineers have to take physics and chemistry. Mechanical engineers have to take physics. I think they take a little bit of chemistry. Chemical engineers take a lot of chemistry and a little bit of physics. And biomedical engineers have to take chemistry and physics and biology and put all of that together to solve problems, to work with biological systems. <clears throat> so basically, get some slices of bread and try not to touch them, some of these, because you want to have some clean ones. One piece will go directly into a bag. It'll be your control. So it shouldn't grow mold very easily because it hasn't been touched, it hasn't been, you haven't breathed on it or anything. So hopefully maybe you've been working outside or doing, you haven't washed your hands in a while, just wipe one piece on your hands. So that's your dirty one. You just wipe on, I, I sort of coughed into mine too to give it a little bit extra germs to grow mold. Um, then try using hand sanitizer on your hands, then wipe your hands on another piece, put it in a Ziploc bag, then wash your hands with hot water and soap really well and put it in there and then take one if your parents will let you and sort of wipe it on a dirty old computer keyboard maybe your chromebook don't get don't wipe it too much where you get crumbs all over your, your keyboard but wipe it around with something that's probably dirty like a keyboard and label them i used a sharpie and put them together um, put them in a dry location mark the bags i try to use organic bread it's a little more expensive but it didn't have any preservatives in it but Mine has been sitting there for two days and it still isn't showing signs of mold, so it may take a few days for this to work. So we want to basically look at how much we need to clean our hands. If we have something dirty, like dirty hands, maybe it's going to be nasty and grow lots of mold. We'll see. Biological systems, though, are inherently um, uncertain, so sometimes it's difficult to get a, a good um, biological experiment. These are sometimes tricky. But how we measure this? You have to think about looking at counting the mold spores or how, how much mold is on there. There's different ways to quantify and measure mold, but it's not as direct as some other methods. Biomedical engineering, like I said, focuses on medicine and healthcare. They use knowledge of biology, physics, chemistry, mechanics, materials, lots of different things. They do a little bit of mechanical and electrical and chemical and materials engineering all together to make and improve medical devices and processes. So you could work on prosthetics or it's like a dialysis device biomedical devices and that concludes what we're talking about today um, i'll post a few other links i've got my sterling engine my steam engine and some other links that you may be interested in looking at